Check. Check. Take 15. Greetings. It is I, Hoos. Happy Solstice, PSers. Welcome to Gaming MBS episode 371, recorded December 21st, 2021. Take it away, Brett and Sean. Welcome to Gaming NBS Tabletop RPG Podcast. I am Sean. And I'm Brett. Welcome to the show, folks. Welcome back. Glad everybody's on board and here. Sean, how the hell are you, man? Doing all right, Brett. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. How is, uh, how's the gaming for you? Got anything uh, cool since last time we talked last week? Mm, cyberpunk radish. Yeah, that's about <laughs> okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Fun, though? Yeah, it was always, always a good time. That's good. Yeah. You? Let's see. We had uh, a little gaming group extravaganza before the holiday season kicked in here. We had, um, we took uh, everybody who was working took last Friday off and um, we finished up uh, out of the abyss rage of demons that alpha was running. So we finished that up. That was fun. Um, we beat Demogorgon. That was not easy, even though he was wounded by the time we got to him. It was still a son of a bitch. Um, got that done. That was a lot of fun. And then, um, we started at, that was like a later in the day, 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock kind of start on a Friday. And then uh, Saturday, we started at my place at noon. <clears throat> Everybody showed up, had lunch. Watched uh, Conan the Barbarian because it's been a long time since we all, all watched that. Just kind of get into that. Up, level up a couple characters, got things set, and then they dove right back into Return to the Tomb of Horrors. And we went at that for, got eight hours. <laughs> it was fun. We got to uh, the Fortress of Conclusion. Pretty much right up to the the last stages. It's the last stage. Like, are they going to make it? Are they going to survive? It was fucking dicey. It was touch and go. Finger of death. Took one guy down. They were able to figure out a way. Like, oh, we can resurrect him. And realize that being in the negative material plane, <clears throat> they brought back Beta's character. You're alive. You're up. Well, he wouldn't say you're alive. He goes, what? You're undead. Sorry. Son of a bitch. <laughs> so, not even a dead party member. And... <laughs> <laughs> excuse me it's fun so it was a lot of fun um but we have this week normally i'd be playing tonight tuesday but i couldn't uh everybody's out we're got too many different family things going and and all that good stuff and then next week more people are out so it'll be after the first of the new year when we get back to it hopefully wrap it up in january but uh it was a hell of a good time a lot of good food my wife uh made her uh homemade lasagna which was freaking awesome it was a lot of good a lot of good stuff I eat way too much crap, dude. I am going <laughs> to... Like, I don't... Tis the season. Like, man, I, I'm trying to work out and, dude, trying to be healthy, but, like, shit like that, man. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> it was fun. It was a hell of a good time. It's fantastic. Looking forward right? to it. You know, um, speaking of gaming, dude, I got my uh, my BSRCon badge, so hey. I'm good there. I got that set. I'm going to be getting my game submitted, so that'll be that'll be done soon. I also, in the spirit of buying badges, I went out and bought evercon.org. I'm not running evercon anymore. Passed it off to the next generation of folks to run it. But I did uh, buy myself and my two kids their weekend passes, so the three of us are going to be there. I know uh, Nola Bert said he's going. I uh, dropped that out on Twitter. He said he's coming. That'd be great. <clears throat> I'll get some games I'm going to run there as well. God, I can't show up at a local gaming con and not run some Avalon, so that's going to happen. We'll do that. But, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. That one should hopefully be, um, that's in March of this year, evercon.org. Check it out. And um, hopefully everything will work out fine. That'll be in person, and uh, we should be good. So, do, 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 do. Um, hmm. anything new on your side, man? Any other notes, news bits, anything we should talk about? No, I don't think so. Okay. Well, then we can jump right into it. Let's go to Random Encounter. Let's do it. Random Encounter, segment in the show where we field voicemails, emails, comments from social media. Go for it, man. All right, I will. First one is Eric J. on Good Dice Go Bad. Ah. Yeah. I got a... F Here we go. And it, good, good. When Good Dice Go Bad is a misconception... The concept of hot or cold dice is an illusion. 
Previous roles do not affect the next role. This phenomenon has happened to most people I've gamed with, and even me. It feels real and can lead to a bad gaming experience. If you were you were close to the answer when you talked about other ways to be effective. Whether you hit the target number or not, the solution to being effective is to have the player's actions have a meaningful effect. Your position in combat, threatening, blocking, or even flanking, should be effective on its own. Doing damage or laying on a condition is the cherry. Changing the terrain, distracting an opponent, rescuing a teammate should be done by whoever is in the best place to do it. Whoever has been rolling low. Not by who, whoever has been rolling low. Combat should be a chaotic maelstrom of motion. The environment should be affected. Things should break, mead from tankards cast off an overturned table, or coins spewing out of a ripped sack should cause hazardous terrain. Goals and opportunities should be changing with the environment. A goblin might see the chance to grab a chicken leg and a few coins, then escape with their newfound wealth. Or the MacGuffin amulet, both sides desperately need fly into a pile of food just thrown onto the floor and is consumed by one of the boars running around in the chaos. It all sounds great, but I find many of the encounters I run or play in the end are more like I attack, I hit, 8 damage, or worse, I attack, I miss again. These dice suck. Advice like this can be found by wiser and more experienced gamers than me. From Matt Colville's action-oriented monsters to Finch's The Way of the Ming Vase. Maybe you should queue up an episode on how to prepare and run encounters that are exciting and chaotic, even when the rules and character sheets emphasize a more mechanical war game style play. Sean, I have talked about that type of thing, frankly, for the last, I don't know, six, seven years bits and pieces here and there, but uh, it is definitely worth bringing back because, <clears throat> and like I said the, on the episode, I want to focus more on um, on the player's perspective. I think there's definitely the game master's perspective. Like, what do you do as GM when you see the dice are bad, right? Where somebody's not having fun because of the dice. How can you do things different? The action oriented monsters that Matt Colville has, that's a damn fine idea. I've not read uh, The Way of the Ming Vaz, but that's probably pretty good it's matt finch um that's good stuff and i think there's um i think that's if we come back at it i think part of it is like it is almost the gm's tools around what happens when dice go bad dice go bad and i think you're right there's a bit of a um an illusionary aspect of it right sometimes it just the odds are there but i can uh I still stand by the fact that, from a player's perspective, what we talked about last time, I think was pretty, um, I think was pretty solid. But I like this um, this glimpse here into like what does the game master, what could the game master do to amp things up and change it so that when I attack, I miss again. I attack, I miss. I attack, I hit. How do we break that cycle and making things more chaotic slash action oriented? and uh impactful so i like it i think that's a good uh, i think that's a good next step we'll have to definitely cue something up on that so thank you i appreciate you writing in that's good stuff thank you eric <clears throat> all right okay where the hell are we oh there we go Mirko replies to eric and Mirko said i was going to make a similar comment totally agree it could feel like that sometimes but obviously one bad die roll has no bearing on the odds for another there's no such thing as a player having notoriously bad luck with dice at least average out over multiple sessions so that part of the discussion didn't really resonate with me having said that this is where how you handle fail rolls of gm makes a huge difference and some systems are a lot more helpful in that regard fail forward mechanics and systems like fate pbta uh d-i-t-d d-i-t-d blades in the dark blades okay uh, etc <clears throat> make failing interesting rather than five e's for example simple lack of impact essentially just a misturn so Mirko, i'm gonna challenge you man um there are if you look at pure odds it's entertaining like i said if you look at a graph that would say hey sean if you roll 500 d20s you're gonna have an average of blah I can tell you from gaming with Sean in a session that we have I have played with Sean for four hours and he's not rolled above a 10 on a D20 for four hours. And he didn't just roll twice. He rolled like 40, 50, 60 times. Big combat, back and forth, swingy, a lot of activity, but he rolled for shit. 
And I've seen that happen to Sean repeatedly from session to session. And I, I think it is logical that the math says this is what happens. But I do think that <laughs> some people have bad luck when it comes to this type of thing. And I think part of it is like what other... We could talk about luck and various other components of it, or if that's perhaps the more colloquial term for something else. But I I notoriously put a D20 in my hand as a player. I could play for eight hours and not hit anything. I know it's happened to me on multiple occasions where I can't hit anything. This isn't going to happen. You know, I can make skill checks, but I can't do something else. Or I just flat can't hit anything as in any target number. So... It's not like it just feels like it, but I think it actually does happen. I've seen it happen. The other component is even if it, even if the idea that it's only perception, perception is reality for lots of this stuff. If you feel like you're fucking failing all night long, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it, it's just as bad as if it's actually bad luck or whatever you want to call it. So, yeah, and I do think there are certain there are certain systems that do help with that. But games like D&D and so on are more toolboxy and um, they tend to have they allow for more art as opposed to mechanics when it comes to certain things, pass, fail or otherwise. So anyhow, more to come on that, Mirko. I think that ties directly into what Eric is talking about. And as you said, you were going to make a similar comment. So I think it comes into like, what do what do we do? Because the answer can't always be play a different game because that's not always the, the right answer or even the best answer. Um, so I think uh, this is good stuff. I like, I like the feedback, and I think this is, this is interesting. The perspectives are great, and I think if nothing else, Sean, this gives us more fodder for, the next, for another episode. So that was good stuff. Thanks, Marco. Yeah, thanks, Marco. Next one, the warden for he says same thing and good dice gone bad brett's moving my text around don't do that brett <laughs> Mess with um for games where higher results yield a greater chance of success i tend to keep two sets of dice in my bag at all times one to use as a player and another when game mastering because one tends to roll higher ideal for killing monsters and the other rolls lower less chance of killing pcs where it gets tricky is when games use their bell curve to create things like success with complications and things like that, where kicking ass isn't the most interesting way to play, such as PBTA games. In that case, the median range is ideal and two dice added together no longer care which is your best and which is your worst. They smash together to create which the fuck they want. <laughs> I feel like one of the things that the warden talks about here is um, where certain games, complications and things like that, where kicking ass isn't the most interesting way to play. I think one of the challenges is that sometimes kicking ass is the most interesting way for certain people to play. That is the way that they enjoy gaming more, right? In which case, again, I could go to the, well, in that case, play Gumshoe, right? Play Nice Black Agents because you're Jason Bourne against vampires or so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, no, what, what he's saying there does make sense. And I know myself, I'm not, I'm not a big PBTA fan. And part of it is, I think, honestly, what you're talking about here, Warden, is that that kind of median range, um, and the, the way it use a lot, utilizes the bell curve just doesn't, this doesn't sing to me, right? It's just not my, not my jam. It doesn't mean people don't have fun doing it because if that's working for you, it's totally good, but huh. I like that. That's another good perspective that ties in quite nicely to what the other comments were around, where games where higher result yeah, higher results yield a greater chance of success. I think that's a good way to put it. So Todd, I think that was that's well that's well spoken. I think that underscores some of the stuff that Eric and uh Marco said above. I like that. That's that's damn what we got smart listeners, dude. Yeah, man. We smarter than us. Anything else? No? We're good? We're good. All right then. Oh my God! You moved the topic way up to the top. I gotta move. That this was down. there, was it? Then I did yeah, it wrong. I think so. Jesus it's good Christ! Right main topic. Oh, you were main topic. Oh my God! I'm terrible at all this. I gotta put in the main topic. You do sound effect because the stupid sound effects got messed up again. Oh, Sean, where are you? Main topic. 
right. Ah, there it is. <laughs> Brad, what are we talking oh, about this week? Multiple NPCs. So we had this a while back. Uh, one of our listeners brought up the, hey, I ran a whole bunch of um, whole bunch of uh, P- NPCs. It can be very confusing and so forth. And I have run a number of different games where there's a lot of uh, NPCs happening and, and things going on. I absolutely sympathize, right? <laughs> it's a son of a bitch, quite frankly, when you've got, if, if you have, let's just use the classic fantasy example trope, right? You're at the king's court, the queen's court. She has 15 people who all have a voice. The player characters are trying to say something. You're trying to um, simulate the confusion or the chaos or have different NPCs voice their opinions and so on and so forth, back and forth. Um, It can be challenging to try to run multiple NPCs. And sometimes multiple isn't five, six, ten, a dozen. Two or three can be a son of a bitch at the same time. It can be hard trying to run a tavern scene. I think one of the reasons why taverns can be challenging for for role playing, <coughs> excuse me, can be that trying to interact with five, six, eight different NPCs in a crowded tavern can be a son of a gun for the poor GM to try to keep track of. So, um, Sean, when you run when you run games, do you ever find yourself in a spot like, oh shit, there's too many too many characters for me to have for me to have to run NPCs? Do I have too many at the table? Or in at any given point, do you worry about? Does that ever crop up on you? Where I, I've had it happen, where you're like introducing, 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 you're like, "Fuck, there's 20 of them." <laughs> you know, I'm not exaggerating, right? But you're like, "Oh shit, I just put five NPCs in here, and I gotta, well, I better come up with some personalities real quick that I can remember." You know, that type of thing. I don't, I don't get into that many, but I'd say, yeah. I mean, five, six might be the the tops, and it can be interesting when they're all in the same room but most of the times i think it's a matter of two uh i right now in the forbidden lands game they will have three npcs potentially in the group and so that may most of the times i think one will be definitely in the back okay the shadows right probably more Un- uh, subconsciously from from a choice perspective. M- me, right? Like, I'm not going to have these three be in the spotlight every conversation just because they're there. Got it. And it's not, it may not be good or bad or consciously doing it that way or not. More than likely, that's the way it's going to end up. I have, um, what was going to say, <clears throat> I have found out that, um, so let me throw this at you. So when I would run, I learned to do this when I ran Vampire a lot because they would they would go to the Vampire Court or there would be, they would quiz people, they'd be at a tavern, they'd be at the Succubus Club, this huge place in Chicago where there's tons of vampires and all this different, all these different people to talk to. Sometimes it's very easy for me to say, like if you're in a large building and there's groups of people, there's groups of NPCs you could go talk to, right? It's easy for uh, easier, at least. Um, so I'm going to say this from my point of view. I find it easier to smash cut between groups then, right? But okay, Sean, who are you talking to? I want to go talk to this group over here. Great. I want to go talk to this NPC over here, says somebody else. Eileen says, I want to go second floor and talk to this person. So that's like just splitting the party. In a way, but at least they're contained within an area, contained within a party, an event, which can be helpful. And sometimes even people leave or do whatever. <clears throat> but when that's happening, then smash cutting from group to group to group, um, I find to be fairly simple. Like we have an episode on smash cuts and, and stuff as well from all, all the way back a few years ago. We could probably um, redo that per- perhaps. But that helps <clears throat> because um, not everybody's trying to talk. All the NPCs aren't involved in the same conversation. Right. So one of the other things I would do is that when people would go to talk to like in mass, someone would say, I want to go talk to the head of this vampire clan, the Torador clan. So they want to go talk to the head Torador and they've got two or three sycophants with them or bodyguards or whatever or people around them because I want to make it seem like they're interrupting a conversation or something's going on. Um, If it's one player going up there, it's easier because anything I'm saying, you know, I can say, well, 
the bruja on the left says this, this person over there says that, and the player says, ooh, how does this person react, and so forth. And it's very easy to capture one person's attention and have them follow along with how we're skipping between NPC people, right? I found that when I would have more than one player character, the players would be trying to talk to a group of people. I would often, <clears throat> when I would say something, I would either preface it with, you know, the Bruja on the left looks really angry and pipes up with the traitor you went to talk to, waves a hand at him like, calm down, you hot-headed fucker. Here's the real answer, she says. Well, in that case, then this person pipes. So I would use um, the descriptor, either the name, or if they didn't get a name out of the person, like whoever, the fighter, the dwarf, the elf, you know, some kind of a descriptor, <clears throat> you know the female warrior over there or the, the stern looking person so that they would understand who was talking because for me running the multiple NPCs, I'm not worried about the personalities so much, although we could talk about them, that in a bit, but I want to worry about the clarity of the information coming forward to the characters. Because if I say something and then the players walk away and say, Oh yeah, we went to talk to the queen and cheaper cry her, her her man in arms was completely and i go no 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 no. that was a queen that was the man in arms well i thought you said the queen said that no no it was this you know that that can be very confusing so for me to cut the confusion is when i say something i always denote who is saying it almost like a uh, a very juvenile approach at novel uh, writing a novel you know the man at arms angrily stated how dare you say that to my queen the queen then replied Tut tut, Bartholomew, you should let our guests speak. You know, as corny as that sounds, that really helped me just clarify everything for the group. Like, oh, this is the person talking. This is why they're talking that way. Um, and oh, this guy's a dick. <laughs> or wow, this person is just, she's horribly mean or evasive or whatever the case is. Does that make sense, Sean? It does, but the easiest way to do it is if you just use different voices, Brett. Yeah, if you can do that, yeah, go right ahead. <laughs> yeah, I can't do that. You can't or you won't? Or won't. Um, yes and yes. Um, mm. I'm not very I – can, I can grab an accent, like for a key NPC type of thing. You know, it, I can butcher some Irish accent or I could try to do this or try to throw a German accent in there or an Australian. The and I'm beauty, terrible at them. Here's the beauty of that stuff, Brett. Mm -hmm. There is no Germany. There is no Ireland. And those areas, yeah. So what I tend to do is because we talked about this because I don't – I have a harder time doing voices than I do describing mannerisms or ways of speech. Oh, so we've talked about that before, too. And the other thing that I have found is that this is where <laughs> I started writing this shit down. You know, who are you talking to? The head of the trade or I know I know that person's name. I know the two Bruja, they're, they're also seeking something. And I know the the other uh, trade or who's with them. So as they would go, I'd say angry, sad, hates PC, pissed off. You know, just quick little jotted note um, as I developed it, because we would be going along and one character would be like, hey, I walk up. I have this conversation. Everything's going fine. They say the wrong thing. Bad die roll, perhaps, if we're calling for die rolls or they just say something. We're just going pure role playing back and forth. And the mood changes, the tone changes that I can make a note. I've actually done an up arrow like they're happy and then done a down arrow like they're angry now. <laughs> Just a simple little shorthand in the notebook. Like, hey, this is where this is where I'm at. This is how this is working. But I found that the the easiest way for me to play multiple NPCs is to be crystal clear every time one of them is speaking, identifying who is speaking and how they're speaking before they say what they're going to say. Not only has that clarified things for the players, but in Brett's head, that clarifies the shit for me too. I remember that if I have some snarky comment to say. Oh, yes, Bartholomew, <laughs> the Queen's guard. He's a snarky fucker. And he's been saying snarky fucker shit for the last five minutes. Guess who says the snarky thing? Bartholomew, right? The Queen has been very pleasant and she's been trying to smooth everything over. And she understands the PCs are important in trying to, you know, get past Bartholomew's full pause, right? 
that's so something on that line, you know, that I, I personally learn who needs to say what has to be said in certain conversations. Or if there's a change, I do this in Call of Cthulhu during investigations. If the my kids were doing, we were playing Call of Cthulhu, um, and they were had a little bit of role playing, doing pretty well. And I said, well, let's give me a role to see if you can push this person, see if you can influence them a little bit. Um, how do you want to get that in front? You want to threaten them? You want to do this? And Alana's like, I kind of want to push her. I want to threaten her a little bit, but not a lot. Okay, let's get a role. Let's get a role going here. And she miserably failed the role, like colossal failure. Well, the person immediately got offended, and the whole tone of the conversation changed because they fucked up. And it was, um, it was you know, w- worthy of note. And even in a larger group of, con- uh, of people, I tried to do the same thing, right? So the queen is talking. She's being very calm. Bartholomew's being a snarky fucker, blah, blah, blah. And then one of the player characters said something incredibly stupid, rude, and offensive. Now she's like, oh, huh, turns out my man at arms is right. You're a bunch of fucking rat catchers. Get out of here. Right? Fickle. I can show that this person is um, doesn't tolerate that type of thing, or whatever the case is. So, anyway, I, I think those pieces for me, when I clarify who's saying it, why they're saying it, you know, in my, <clears throat> and making my little side notes. The thing that, other thing that that helps me do is that if I have certain information that can or will be let go, in the large conversation, I've got a good idea of where it should come from based on interactions with the players, which NPC is doing this, that, or the other thing, because it can be very dynamic. I've had player characters working an NPC over in front of somebody else, and they're scoring points with that in other with another NPC who's a rival of the person that they're working over a little bit. So then I try to make a note of that. Okay. You know, they made Bartholomew look stupid, but Courtney thinks that's hilarious. She hates him anyway. She has some private information for them. Then she'll sneak around the she'll sneak around later on and say, Hey, love what you did back there. By the way, this is what you need, and the piece of paper is handed over, type of thing. Um so that anyway, that that's just a couple things off the top of my head that I found very useful or helpful for me. Um, just to keep it just to keep it very clear as to who's talking. Um, The other thing is that uh, unless the player characters ask me for names or more specific details, sometimes someone in the crowd or an obvious man at arms or the sergeant, you know, the sergeant says this, and she just glowers at you like any good military sergeant. She's got a baleful stare, right? Oh, I see. Well, the sergeant's mad. Does she need a name right now? Not necessarily. If the characters don't ask me for it, if the players don't dig into it, I can pass by that. And sometimes that NPC can be a throwaway NPC, right? It's the beat cop you're talking to. You talk to that person, then then you move on from there type of thing. Does this make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. You're not buying it? I buy it. I just think that you're short stepping. I think you could use, okay. even if you don't use like a unique tone of voice, you could probably slow down your speech. Okay. Or speed it up. I like that. No, that's good. That's a good ad, honestly. It is. I I tend not to use that, but I like what you're saying. Yeah. I think people overrate the the funny voice thing. Or they over they over not over examined, but they 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 think they got to be Matt Mercer and the Critical Role crew to be. <sighs> You're right. Yeah. Voice actors to 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 do that. Yeah, because I, I I said it right out of the gate, right? A- accent. It doesn't have to be an accent, right? So even accent. if you even if you just say speaks nervously, well, well, well I, I, I kind of has bad stutter. You could throw that in there. You could say they um they speak quickly, act dismissively, right? Sure, whatever. Don't care. You know, angry tone of voice, and um, how how does that emotion that I took down in my notes? How does that come across in what they say? And you, it would be inter- What would be interesting is I feel like I'm not doing that, but I'm going to have to ask my gaming crew if I do do it, or maybe mm-hmm. go back and listen to some of the actual plays and like, do I actually do it or not? I don't know. 
Maybe I'm subconsciously changing tone and I'm just not even aware of it. That is possible. It's so, it's like so that. subtle like that, that I think it's a it's low hanging fruit for those who feel. Here's the thing I think with that, and I know it's a little tangent to the to the topic at hand, but with those specific approaches to voices, would do a couple things. One, it would tell the difference between who you're talking about or who you're referring mm-hmm. to when you GM. And two, I think it would add a bit of immersion to the players because they would relate to the person based on the voice to some degree without having to talk like Jack Benny. Probably nobody knows who Jack Benny is. <laughs> this group. I do. I know right. who Jack Benny is. <laughs> right. Or whatever, right? So, if you, yeah. you know. Um, have you had conversations between NPCs? Yes, I have. And have, that's actually... Have you had conversations with more than three NPCs at once? Yes. How many... What's the maximum you've had? Ballpark. In a larger vampire games, like when everybody, like all the clans are there and people are arguing and fighting and screaming back and forth <laughs> like a dozen. Right. Wow. Okay. But I, but I tend to... I, I group it then, right? This group of people, these three, these three folks say things like, and then, or they get angry. Or so you're like summing up. I'm bundling. Yes. Yeah, I'm summing up like a feeling from this group or a feeling from that group. You're not literally, t- you're not literally conveying each one. No. In what? Because I, unless the player says, "Who said that?" Right. Which one of those five said that? Yeah. That snotty fucker. All right, did he really say that? And then I'm going to go, yes. Because in a fight, you really want to know who that is. You really want to know who the loud mouth (laughs) is. Yeah, if you're you're a cold cock, somebody you want to have a good idea, you hit the right person, right? What? Who said that? Did What? You say that? You you talking to me? You talking to me? Talking to me, man. So this this is horrible on my part. I had a note on who wrote this topic to us, Sean, and I cannot find it. It's one of our BSers, and I cannot find the Is it on the forums? It, maybe it is. And if I'm, you take a string in there and probably put in the search, I'm sure it would come I up. I tried it. I'm fucking oh, it up. Seriously? I can't find it. So I feel like it is. Maybe somebody wrote it. So <laughs> I am really, really sorry because I feel horribly stupid right now. We so, take I, credit with no apology. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I'm going to throw this out here because the, the, the listener was saying, aside from having, okay, so what had happened was they had um, uh, a bunch of people, they, uh, kill a cockatrice, blah, 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 and all these people who turn to stone start coming back to life, right? So this is what's happening at the end result. They said, aside from having six people join the story in a rel- relatively short amount of time, trying to keep what, each one interesting, I also want to end up with the PCs trusting and liking some of the NPCs, but having some of the troublesome ones get under the radar without having a, a dishonest gotcha moment. <laughs> and that's what really got me thinking about this was, for me, when I have a group of, like, if this were to happen to me, and I'm not there, so I, I'm not saying what this what this game master did was right, wrong, or indifferent. I'm just saying what I would do is I would say people are pretty happy. A couple of people are like shocked. They're disoriented. They're they are saying things like and I tend to talk like in a group. The group says people do. Certain people are like this. And when I generalize what a quote unquote mob, right, like six people, you know different genders, different nationalities, different um, races in some cases, all these different people. The the gnomes are arguing, the dwarves are trying to figure out what's going on. The elf was like, oh my gosh, where's the forest? I thought where, you know, they're having this kind of very cacophonous dialogue. What I found that by doing that, the people that I've played with, and even when I've done this at gaming conventions, people are like, okay, 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 okay. Let's try to sort this out. I try to calm everybody down. Is any one person, was it Edwin that said this to us? Maybe it was Edwin. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. Oh, my God. I knew you could find this faster than me. Edwin, I'm a jackass, and I apologize, sir. So in this case is when I generalize the conversation, there's six people. They're all there complaining. A few of them say, one person says, and so forth. When I do that, the players will then ask me, who said that? Is anyone? Is everyone okay? Is somebody really pissed? You said someone sounded like they were angry. Yes, the dwarf is really mad. Well, can we find out why the dwarf is mad? Well, his name is, you know, 
His name is Hex, and he's really pissed off because of X, Y, and Z. Oh, okay. All right. That, that's legit. That's legit. Well, you also said somebody said this. Who said that? Slim then, Shady. Yeah, Slim Shady said that. Um, but I can then I can then break it apart based on what the player characters are interested in. So one of the cool pieces for me then is if I say, if I know for a fact that there's a doppelganger in that group or there's an evil motherfucker in that group, I say, ah, this evil guy. I say a bunch of things since the group all talking. The player characters go, huh, well, all right, people complain. I just calm them down. Yeah, give me my charisma check. Everybody calms down, calm down, calm down. Okay, well, we're off and running. And they refuse, or refuse is too strong. They fail to or don't want to check or don't want to be bothered by or for whatever reason, don't dig into the NPCs. I don't have to create anything. I have a group of people who were recently turned to stone, very recently freed from that prison, now talking rather incoherently amongst and around each other. And then depending what the characters give a shit about, that's what I'll dig into. Um, very rarely have I run into player characters who want to know who each individual is, name, rank, and serial number, of all six of these NPCs, and then take it from there. They're more interested in, okay, so there's two dwarves, a halfling, and three elves, huh? Wow, what a weird. Were they all were you all part of some adventuring company? No, they say they're part of this, that, and everything. Oh, interesting, interesting. So this elf and that dwarf were together. Well, that's kind of like old Gimli Legolas thing, huh? Kind of cool. What are their names? That conversation between the players and I leads me to flesh out the NPCs that they care about. I also then get to have that little sneaky, dishonest NPC either be one of the ones that they want me to flesh out. Or just kind of fades in the background, you know, the assassin who is in there. And then in the night, one of the NPCs of the six they found is found dead and they don't know what's going on. And someone is framed for it or however sneaky, crazy I want to be with it. But frankly, in, in cases like that, what I've done is, as I said, I, I just I follow the PC's lead. It's a cacophonous they grouping, how they talk, everybody's saying stuff. If no one cares to dig into who's saying what, we move on. I've had this happen many times when, when a rescue happens. We're going into your, in here to save the, these captured town folks from the ogres. They go in, they rescue the towns from, from the ogres. Is someone in charge? Yes, it's, you know, this matron and this uh, young man seem to have, the, have everything in control. It's uh, Esmeralda and, you know, Tommy. All right, cool. Esmeralda and Tommy. Off you go, because that's the only ones that the players ask me about. If they want to get into the rest of it, I will develop as necessary. But unless they do, I do not. I save myself the trouble of trying to on the spot come up with all this crap for these NPCs that no one cares about. That makes sense, Sean. You're saying no. It not makes deep sense. Enough? I just. Uh, you think I'm leaving too much on the table? I should I just, just go you know, all the way. But, you know, if you want to. Short step stuff. That's cool. I mean, that's all right. That's a style thing. It's a style choice. It's a style, yeah, it's a yeah. Style. I know. I'm just. I'm not. I, I look. I. I'm no Sean Kelly. I'm well, just saying. I'm going to throw that out there right now. Yeah. I mean, it's all right. I don't. There. Hey, there's no okay. wrong way. If your group accepts <laughs> that, wow, that's fine. Wow. If your group is tolerant of your slipshod bullshit, Brett, go for it. Nice. I mean. So Sean, how and do? Alpha how and you? Beta, Beta and Zeta and Bravo and Charlie, like hey, no, don't, no, don't don't mind. Alpha, Beta, Lenny, Zave. I think Nick, and Nick, right. and Jr. I think. I mean, I just on behalf of your own game group, mm -hmm. they you know twenty twenty two is not far. All right, so let, let throw some wisdom at me. How would you do it, Sean? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you asked, Brett. All right. I'll sit back here, get my note paper out. I uh I, similar to you, would probably and have made sure that the player characters players know the who they who's kind of speaking. Like, hey, this person speaks up. Hey, that person's talking. Blah blah blah. You overhear that individual whatever the one time I actually had a conversation with myself in any degree 
was, I think, the two buzzards that were in the Forbidden Lands game that I was running that they ran into in the tower. <laughs> The Waldorf so it, and whatever the other grumpy. Oh, Stat, Statler and Waldorf. Statler and Waldorf of, from the Muppet Show. From yes. the Muppet Show. But see, with that situation, it didn't matter who was saying what necessarily. Correct. Because they're necessarily. that same person kind of thing. They're like the two headed ent, Enten, right? Yeah. Fair. I mean, you could have. I mean, you've seen Labyrinth, right? You, uh, it's been doors. a long time. You have two doors. One of us always tells the truth. The other always tells a lie. Right. Which said that, the right or the left, which way you're going, so on and so forth. So sometimes who said what could be very critical. It could be relevant, I think, mm -hmm. if it is in those situations. Like one says, hey, I, one, I tell the truth, the other one tells a lie, but we can't tell you which one's which. Whatever. Then it's like, who said that? You know? Yeah. yeah. But with... The, the buzzards, like, they, I mean, they had conversations between themselves and not even amongst the party, right? They were just like, yeah. you know, well, I don't know. Should they do that? Well, they probably should. Well, I don't know. Maybe they, maybe we don't know much about them. Perhaps they're here for this reason. Well, I don't think so by the way that they look. You, you know, what's fun with doing that is um, it adds a level of um, just reality, kind of like, <clears throat> how he says, of distraction. It's not one person bothering them. It's two people having a conversation. Which could or could that they not be relevant it. to whatever's going on, right? It may or may not be irrelevant, right. and it may or may not be distracting, annoying. Why don't you buzzers just shut up? Well, oh my gosh, Statler, boy, he's a very offensive. No, I would say so, Waldorf, and back and forth. Yeah. Right. You can, you can have some fun with that. That could be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, but how many NPCs do you tend to run at? One, do you tend to run once? Do you have a? Uh, we talked about this kind of at the, at the top, but now that we've talked, gone through this. I've thrown some of my ideas out there. Do you? Do you like to? Do you like six fewer, greater? Does it bother you? I wouldn't want to get more than like five or six. I think that's getting a little crazy. And even when it's five or six, two maybe sitting and laying in the weeds or are distracted doing something else maybe they're eating and their mouths are full so they're not talking or they're mm -hmm. talking between themselves if somebody says hey what are they talking about nothing you're listening nothing relevant it's kind of just small talk whatever yep the other guys that are closer to you taking up more of the volume and the, the they're more audible to you you know you pick up this or that and you per specifically hone in on that person across the table, whatever, with the dark hair and the bushy beard or whatever. So I think it's a combination on your approach and then what I don't mind doing funny voices. I think it's fun. Mm -hmm. um, I, sometimes I do them more consistently than others. So, you know, I mean, I can file no. Sometimes I'm put on the spot so it can like be a little under the Nico gun Gruss. to come up with something, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, what Where do I if do? you like prep it, like, oh, I got this NPC, he's going to be really neat, right? He's going to be yeah. modeled after, you know, Bugs Bunny or something ridiculous. Or something. Yeah. Right. Got it. Um, I'll tell you, the, other, the other time this type of thing happens, I have found is that not just like Edwin's example of, um, you know, people <clears throat> being rescued or something like that, but the caravan guard, right? Yeah. You go into the tavern, your caravan guard. Well, my character looks around. Is anything interesting happening? Right. And then you <laughs> you tend to go by a perception um, check. Yeah, so you can do that. But then the other thing you do is what I'll what I will do then instead of calling for the check right away, I say, well, there's um, if it's at camp, if it's like a uh, caravan guard. Well, there's the usual caravan noises, right? People complaining about the short food. They they wish they had more breaks. A lot of this, a lot of <clears throat> a lot of that. Is there something specific you're looking for? any particular type of data you want to get because there's just going to be general complaining and grumping you can zero in on something what are you looking for and then the player in question will say i'm trying to find out if anybody mentions these names or this place i'm trying ah, to find the mcguffin man check. where's yeah, the yeah. mcguffin show me which one's the mcguffin <laughs> give me a perception check for mcguffin checking <laughs> oh you failed sorry no mcguffin found who do i need to listen to that is going to give me the relevant information yeah. that i need <laughs> that's a terrible idea 
back of the class. Right. Um, and in the tavern, much the same. It's like, well, there's, you know, you got some farmers. Like, like I said at the beginning, you've got farmers over here talking about this, that, or, or if it's a spaceport, you're like, look, the, you know, the group of, you know, space teamsters are in here talking about their thing. You've got some of the guard over here. You've got some droids. You've got this, that, that, that. You're like, oh, cool. Okay. Well, is anyone talking about this? Um, possibly roll a perception check and let's see what we can find. Right. And that's where sometimes the dice can be very helpful or any kind of skill check, a perception check or a D6, roll high, roll low, something to add a randomizer to it. Because what you're doing is using that to say, ah, yes, they did find the clue I planted here, which will lead them to the MacGuffin. Or, huh, they rolled well enough. I can tell them without a shadow of a doubt, no one in this caravan gives two shits about Daggerford. Huh. Man, that's interesting. Because we just passed, you know, Daggerford's had all these problems. No one's even talking about her. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. No one cares about Daggerford. You know, so sometimes it doesn't have to be that you have to make up an answer or a hook where you're like, ooh, wow, I really have to. Sometimes an absolute or, or is, yeah, an absolute, I'll say it, is, is um, negative can be really good. Like you, nobody here says anything. You're very cool. You're calm. You kind of ferret things out. You talk it over. It takes you three, four hours, but you made your way through the barn. You're about four gold pieces light from buying drinks, but nobody knows shit about Daggerford. Huh. Interesting. Okay. Well, must be a dead end, guys. And that can speed things up, too. So you don't have to go through the whole, I knew you the first farmer. Great. Funny voice was fun. Neat. I talked to the to the bard. Oh, another funny voice. Interesting. Still doesn't know shit. Cause it ended up making more and more skill checks or bribe checks or whatever. Some people like that where they want to go and have a one-on-one experience with every NPC in the tavern. Can be challenging. Um, especially when you decide one NPC doesn't want to talk to them. The gruff, the gruff um, bartender ignores you. You know, he doesn't Mother take off. it. Yeah, he doesn't want to listen to you. Ooh, that guy knows something. I know he knows something. Oh, for fuck's sake, he's just being a dick. Or he's just rude by nature, or whatever the case is. Um, anyhow, I um, I think there's a lot to be said for following the player's lead, though, really. Like, if they're interested in it, then you can flesh out the NPC. And what can be fun, too, is if they fail to be interested, like Edwin talked about having a couple troublesome NPCs in, in this group of six, if they fail to be interested in, okay, that might cost them. <laughs> you inject them. You inject them. You like, inject okay, them there's there's some the troublesome. There's some trouble here. Yeah. They didn't bother to look into it. It's like walking down the corridor without checking for traps. And then you get a sight of the blade. You're like, oh, what the hell happened? You didn't bother to look for traps, man. Yeah, you didn't steer clear of the talkative one that doesn't shut up and doesn't yeah. tell you anything. Exactly. Yeah. That person you know not to sit next to on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So Edwin, I don't know if this if this helps or not, but I think it's um I, I think there's um the other now that's a lot of them. The other thing that's interesting to me is um kind of goes in part with this. So you talked about introducing NPCs kind of at the tail end, you like there can be a lot of ways or a lot to introducing NPCs. And I think I still like to introduce NPCs um, oftentimes at the, what I want to say is higher level, like not like cl- up in the clouds, 20,000 foot, 50,000 foot, and then come down. But when they, they meet someone for the first time, you know, what's their first, what's their first piece? That person is the sheriff is mean. The sheriff is gruff. They go meet Mr. Johnson. He's incredibly polished. Or, you know, she's very polished. They've got all this stuff together, blah, blah, blah. And then depending how far the PCs want to dig into more about the NPC is when I start divulging more and more. And even if that is, as most folks who listen to us long enough know, I make up a lot of shit on the spot. And that's fine. That's a way to do it. You don't have to do it that way. But for me, part of an improv making up moment is like, who gives a crap? You know? If anybody wants to ask about it, when I ran Avalon for you and uh, Craig and the guy at th- and the guys at Third Floor Wars, depending who folks talk to, there are a lot of voices and things and things happening, people doing stuff. Nobody really got into how the bartender behaves in X Y type of situation. Nobody really figured out does a bartender have an illegitimate son that 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 they're trying to get through college in the background. <laughs> you, you didn't know any of that stuff, right? 
because it d- wasn't relevant for any reason in the conversation. There is um, <clears throat> there's a danger sometimes um, in introducing NPCs where if you put a lot of – when I say danger, I'm saying danger of distraction and um, over-relevance, distraction, or whatnot. But you can get really deep into something and go, oh, this NPC has nothing to do with anything. Great that we know what, how the you know the guy at the local, you know, meat market can't stand the rope merchant. But the fuck does that have to do with anything? Sometimes that that color can be fun, but it can be like a quick, snappy piece, and that's where I like to use some of the dialogue. Like, whoa, but, you know, hey, we we come here looking for X, Y, or Z, and then the the butcher says something. Well, you didn't talk to Roscoe, dude. That son of a bitch. I can't stand who's Roscoe. Roscoe, that's stupid. Rope merchant, I wouldn't buy a rope from him. He's like, yeah, it's fine, fine, fine. Cute bit of color, carry on. Um, the other component is that sometimes if you don't do anything with it, you're like, oh, it's just NPC, who cares? That's dismissive. And you're you're kind of telling the player characters, it's dumb of you, or the players, I should say. You're, you're telling it's kind of dumb of you, a waste of your time to ask me these questions because you picked on something that was un, unimportant because they don't know the players have no idea. So sometimes I have used things like when I know it's unimportant, I'll say, you're talking to this guy. What's his name? It's officer Johnson. Okay. So what, what's her thing? Is she like just a B cop? Yep. She's a B cop. You talked to her a little bit. You've interviewed her. Um, you made your check. You can tell right from that check. That's all she knows. You got a few things else out of her, right? She's busy. She's got, you know, kids at home. She's concerned about this and other thing. But quite frankly, she's not going to add anything more to the conversation. So you're saying she might know something. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, though, Sean? Using yeah. kind of fourth wall breaky language where you say it's very clear to your character based on that successful die roll that they know nothing else. Right. Or it's clear on how bad you rolled. That they're so offended, they're not going to talk to you. It'll take some big action for you to get that librarian back on your side because he's pissed the way you threatened him. That was what happened to my daughter. <laughs> she threatened the librarian. You know that didn't go over so well. Um, <clears throat> but that's um, how do I do this? If they're very important NPCs, I don't mind having a bit of um, a bit of a tell when the NPC is introduced. So let's say within that six uh, or, or a dozen people that are saved, rallied up, or whatever, and one person stands forward and says, I can help you, sir. Um, I know all about these caverns. I can do this any other thing. What's your name? Julie. Awesome. Julie, you you got it down. What do you need? Well, I'm a good fighter, sir. Get Julie a sword. Get her some leather armor. Here we go. Let's rock and roll. Because Julie turns out to be, you know, an ex knight or something or other, or, or whatever it is, it, it's an important NPC, someone you want or you think the character should react to in, in some way or shape or form. There's nothing wrong with overplaying that, right? If that's the NPC that has the cool voice, the cool mannerisms, like, ah, all the signs are there that Sean cares about this NPC. We should probably talk to them, you know? I think that's cool. And there's nothing wrong with that, that type of thing because we're talking about characters often being heroic or, or how do I say this? You know, sneaky, you know, they're conniving characters. They know all this stuff. They've got all these great skills and so forth. There's nothing wrong with um, a couple of gimmies like, hey, this person is a jerk. You should just know you, you can tell right up front. They've been kicking puppies for the last five minutes right in front of you. You can tell they're not nice people. Um, so I don't mind doing that type of thing. <laughs> but again, a lot of it for me is if I don't want to introduce them as something important, then I don't waste a lot of time going through each and every individual NPC and introducing them all. Maybe a couple tells here or there just to make them in person. But if the players want to dig into it, then that tells me they think this is interesting. For whatever reason, tonight's the night they talk to every beat cop in this game of Call of Cthulhu, and they get to know everybody's name, their family members, and where the kids go to school. All right, fine. That's the game we're playing tonight. Off we go. So, that makes sense, Sean. Does. Um, when you introduce an NPC, if it's an important one, do you do a tell of any kind, or do you try to keep it as 
flat as possible. And I'm not saying doing a tell is better or worse than any other. I just I have a tendency to do it because I like to do that. I don't know if that's some people may not enjoy that, but I try not to specifically only because you know they can dive all you know they can they can come across it and discover it themselves. In my opinion, okay. So I that's legit too. Like I said, I'm yeah. not saying my way is better. I just want to know. I mean, there's the pre-written, pre-written, the published adventures. Most of the time, if the group knows I'm running a published adventure, then they're going to know that most of the NPCs are planted and probably have some relevance. But with, well, especially when you say, hey, who is that? You go, um, uh, hang on, hang on. Um, oh, that's um, Dragon Tooth, the so and so. When you're flipping through it and you find the name, they can see you looking at the highlighter. Yeah, yeah you kind yeah. of, they're named. So otherwise, <laughs> I just throw an NPC in front of them and let the party engage and see what happens. Okay. I like, who knows? There, there's I don't so- know if I have any plans for that NPC, but who, you know, they, they could be the main, the main thing. I tell you, there's something to be said for that in certain types of games. Like um, I'm thinking about Call of Cthulhu or Delta Green, right? Where if you don't do a tell, like I was talking about, hmm. it adds to it. It can add to a level of, who do I talk to? What is important? It doesn't um, inadvertently or advertently push me <laughs> in any one direction to either ignore or pay more attention to. I can say I have done it the other way where I have introduced an NPC as a look, right? A tall individual dressed a certain way or a specific um look feel of the person and um always kind of brushes them off they can't get a name on that person or whatever it is and sometimes as little as i divulge made that npc twice as interesting because the person was at a lot of things i saw their picture near a lot of bits and pieces in my heavy investigative games that's always a clue right type of thing like this person and uh, i have done it where that person is just weird or that person just happens to be, you know, they're they're kind of like the rival characters, like trying to figure out the crime to themselves or whatever the case is. They just happen to be at these places at the wrong time or right time, as it were. So cool, man. Edwin, I hope. Um, first off, I apologize again, dude. I, I had your name in here. I, I fucked up and I didn't keep it in there. So I apologize, man. Um, but did that help answer your question or did we miss the mark? And if anybody else has ideas or thoughts around introducing NPCs and or playing large groups of them, let us know what you think. And if there's if you've got other ways, means, policies, devices in order to do that, I'd love to hear about it. I think there's always there's always some. This is one of those pieces that's a, a trick of the trade, right? It's a it's a any tips and tricks you have would be welcome because it's not what I said might it makes sense to me, but somebody could try and go, wow, that's a. That's a cluster. I don't know how to fucking do that, you know? And if there's somebody else who's a different way about it, I'd love to hear about it because we can share it out. So cool stuff. You good, man? Yeah, I'm good. Awesome. Let's move on to die roll. Let's get into die roll. Die roll, two to four miscellaneous points of gaming and geekery we want to share with you. Got one, two, three, four, five this week. A couple that are... Oh... On the Twitters, Let's see, first one, pose this on the forums and Twitter and Discord. What RPG are you going to do your damnedest to get to the table in 2022 that you didn't in 2021? And that thing blew up on Twitter. Um, For me, it's Simba Room. That's that's, that's it, gonna, Brett's. That, that's mine right there. That's the one I got to get to the table. I still, even though it hasn't made it to the table yet, I am still jazzed about it. It's a it's um, a series of books I pull off my gaming shelf that peruse periodically, refreshing my memory about why I like it. You know, you're like, oh yeah, God, this is so cool. Oh my God, this is neat. Oh, this is gonna be so much fun. Um, we got to wrap up a couple other games and make some time for it, but uh, it's got to happen. And you're gonna it's run Simba Room. Cool as is or because it's fifth edition right I don't no i'm not i'm gonna run it i'm gonna run the original version i have fifth edition stuff if i want to run it i want to run it as it was 
intended. <laughs> As the good Lord intended it. Fair. Now I want to. I want to run it in the uh, the alternate uh, mechanical system. I think it's it. fun. All right, Brett has heard it here first. I have, sp- I have spoken. Sean, what's yours, man? Do you have uh, one? Uh, cold shadows. Uh, I prob- I threw Feng Shui in there. Shui, Feng Shui, Feng Shui, um, and Twilight Two Thousand. Okay, if I'm going to add another one, I would say a close second is going to be Vasen or Vasen. I need to still figure out how to, I want to find out how that is ac- I heard accurately. it's Vasen. I heard is somebody Vaisen? corrected okay. me on Saturday. I'm going to say Vasen then. I I started reading that. I'm like, oh my God, this is totally right up my alley. Yeah. So that's that's got to be another one too. Yeah. I showed it to my kids and uh, they both went, ooh, that looks like fun. Somebody said on Saturday, I think it was on Saturday, <clears throat> when I was streaming mm-hmm. that a guy bought Vason, ran it for his kids, and got super pissed off because there wasn't the disclaimer that it was for mature audiences and not for children. Did he not? Okay, first things first. If you read it, just, you know what it is. <laughs> Dude, I was like, man, that is just, come on. That's, a, I'm sorry. That that's just crap. Super I'm, weak I'm gonna, sauce. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it right now. That's just bad parenting. Well, the, I mean seriously. I if I'm like, huh? I read the book. I studied the book. I'm ready to run the adventure. If the adventure says blood, guts, and death and torture, know. you're like, huh? Probably shouldn't run that for my little kids, right? I I told my kids. Ilana looked at it and sort of said, Ooh, that looks interesting. I said, Look, I haven't finished reading it yet, so I don't know. I said, Let me finish it up and then we'll, but probably it should probably work out. But then again, my kids are the ones who, and uh, Ray Otis can attest to this that my youngest, when she was like, I think she wasn't even, she wasn't even 10 yet, I, they were at Gary Con and AJ, Ilana, and Ray, and a couple other folks were playing, and uh, the NPC swallowed a key they needed and and then passed out and my wonderful beautiful little child looked at me and said well why don't we just kill her and tear her guts open and pull the key out <laughs> and i'm like you can make her throw up and she's like no it'd be easier just to gut her and i looked at my friends ray and i said ah, i'm sorry ray just said apple tree it's all good <laughs> so maybe my kids and i are tolerant for certain things but anyway that's just whatever uh, whatever. Whatever. Fuck I don't that. have kids. What are you going to do? Uh, second <laughs> one that I posed out there is, in your opinion, what was the best tabletop RPG purchase that you made in 2021? Ooh. <sighs> the new Delta Green is up on the top for me. I don't remember if I bought that this year. I think I did. I think you and I both did way early in the year. Well, I bought it at Noble yeah. Night when oh, we were fuck. both oh, there. We... Yeah. No, wait. It was pre-COVID. No, that wasn't. We bought it earlier than that. Ooh, wait. I'm a liar. Yeah, I that think we I've had it, it for year. longer we than bought, We bought that for longer than we did. So if I pull that out, I'm going to have to go with. <laughs> I did not buy a lot. I didn't buy a lot this last year. Yeah. Well, you've been so slacking. I think... Well, yeah, a little bit. You've been I hung up on the D's and D's. Yeah, a little bit. I am really the Simbarum thing is just I got so much value out of reading it mm-hmm. and inspiration and fun. The artwork is so enjoyable. I like parsing through it and gleaning lore pieces out of all the sidebars. That's just from a from a cost of value perspective for me. That is that's my that's one of my tops so far. I'd have to say, I'm, I'm yeah, I'll say it. That's the that's the one I'm most pleased with. Wow. Well, mm-hmm. Yeah, I uh, I'm not sure. Somebody there was one person on Twitter that actually brought up a a tool or something like a like a, it wasn't a supplement. It was like a whiteboard or something, right? It wasn't Ooh. a role playing game. It wasn't a supplement. It was just so if I if I go that route is <clears throat> it would be um the because I moved in this house. I've just been here a year now, and uh, so in in 2021 going through and getting the game room set up all the stuff i've done in my my 
my gaming room here in the house downstairs. That would be. Dude, your house the, does not count as the best. I know. Table. <laughs> I'm just saying that, no, the game room in there, if we're talking about whiteboards and so forth, getting the, the table set up uh, was great. I am really, if I'm going to go that route, but sure. I'm going to push that aside and say <clears throat> more for, uh, more for Simber room. I think that makes, I get a lot of. A lot of enjoyment out of that. Even though I, I mean, if it was like a new yet. gaming table or a yeah, I mean, new, is a new dice game. tower Everything. that looked kick ass or something. It's a new gaming table. It's yeah. a new gaming fridge. It's a new gaming shelf. It's a new gaming TV. It's I think fucking it took me all year to do it. But an overachiever. Yeah, I'm a crazy bastard. Next <clears throat> anyway. Okay. Next one, Hero Five E Mega Mega Bundle, which is going to be open for looks like twenty days, which consists of. Hero 5e Core Collection, Hero System 5th Edition, System Sidekick, Core Source Books. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So if you are a hero person, this would be the bundle. And then proceeds, because it always kicks into a charity, uh, goes to direct relief um, for critical care medications to health workers and emergency deliveries to medical facilities across the U.S. and Canada for direct relief very cool yeah so that's that next one D D fifth edition a5 adventurers journal with character sheet kickstarter this is so hilarious pledge of 264 dollar goal it's up to six grand <laughs> it's free. so good on good on this person which is pretty fully cool. fully funded in 19 minutes yeah because it states on a kickstarter page but it's I've I saw these Harrigan pointed it out, and uh, it's a pretty good journal kind of thing, which I've always been intrigued in making. I'm just not a very good designer, and I don't know an illustrator very well. One of the things that's um, <laughs> depending on the type of uh, game you're in, five E, it's um, I think it's it's hard to kill character you, you can do and so on. But one of the things that my, my group has had a hard time with when it comes to really fancy journals and stuff like that is like, well, what I do when they die, <laughs> I filled this thing out and they died. Oh, <laughs> like, Oh, I got the super fancy thing and they're dead. Fuck. <laughs> but I need, if it's like, um, that's why my care, my, my players did like PDF printable pro- products. Like, hey, a really cool kick-ass character sheet. They love that. Or a character folio character sheet that you can print out. People are jazzed about that because, like, ooh, I can have this for every character. That way, even if they croak on me, I can do something else. Yeah, this one is coming up December 28th, yeah. 2021. So, and I imagine they'll probably sell it on the side, I'm guessing. But it looked it looked neat. I liked it. And Harrigan put it out there. I should also say it's- that uh, C- CJ, a.k.a. Polish Ogre, Right of the Hero 5e Mega Bundle link. And then lastly, Brett's favorite Monty Cook game that he picked up and never played, Invisible Sun. Humble Bumble, or the bundle of holding, not to be confused yep. with Humble Bundle. This one's got like 13 days left on it. So if you are wanting to get into Invisible Sun, Invisible Sun, uh, this would be the way to go. It's the digital version of it, no, yes. not a physical black cube, of course. No, but there's of also, if you go there, there's Paranoia Red Clearance, Paranoia 2004, there's Forged in Dark on this bundle of holding as well. So if you go out there and check out any of those links, you'll find those things too. Very cool. Shown here is the physical version of the Invisible Sun Black Cube, not the digital version in this offer. We just wanted to make it look real freaking cool. That's why we yes. put that picture in there. This um, is what Brett's, this is what Brett sold without playing. And I th- I don't know I I I got to think that the the bundle of holding must pick the charity because this one's also for direct relief I don't know I could be wrong I don't but know. it's just coincidental sure. that they're the same same charity that is be being uh, and maybe Monty's like yeah that's cool whatever so that's it for uh and that was provided by Merco Froelich by the way so mm-hmm. that's all I had for die roll Brett cool man. Yeah. What well, we next talk- week you get you, you you're the one with the topic, man. You said, "Hey, a rival adventuring party." 
a right yes somebody had mentioned like hey did you guys cover rival adventuring party yet and i don't know if it was nubis or i can't remember somebody on the discord i apologize so if somebody if, when, when folks hear this if you catch this beforehand please speak up and say who you were so that sean and i don't look like complete boobs again and uh, forget edwin's name don't i have it in there though <sighs> do i no, I, don't. No, I don't. um maybe you do maybe you don't i, I don't, don't know but anyway if you don't, we gotta find it because we I gotta. Don't. We have to attribute these kick-ass ideas. It's in the Discord. But, Somebody's like, "Hey," and I remember they suggested yeah, it's it there, before. It's there. Yes, I'll tell you, man. Rival Adventuring Party. Um, when I saw it out there, I was thinking we have not touched on that at all in our seven years. So this is uh, this is pretty cool. So that'll be next week. Yeah. So you gotta tune in and see what that's see all how it about. goes. Right. But otherwise, that's all we had for this week, ladies and gentlemen. If you find any value, even a smidgen, do us a favor. Uh, if you're tuning in live on YouTube or see this later, give us a like. We appreciate it. and Subscribe. We record live on YouTube here every week, Mondays, typically at 8, mm -hmm. uh, 8 p.m. Uh, Central Time U.S. Sometimes we have a scheduling snafu that we got to move, but usually it's Mondays. We are not going to be... We are recording next week, Monday? Yep, we will. Yep. Okay. I've Excellent. got the day off. Do you have the day off? I think I do. Yes. Well, regardless, that evening I am free, so okay. we'll do it. So, tune in live if you'd like. Otherwise, do a search on your podcatcher of choice. Find Gaming and BS. And if you do listen to an episode through your podcatcher of choice, make sure you subscribe so you can get all the updates. Uh, but otherwise... I think that's it for this episode of Gaming BS. I'm Sean. And I'm Brett. Good night and good game and all. This episode of Gaming BS produced with help from the following BSers. Joe Swick, Old School DM, Tony Sugarloaf Baker, Eric Jeppesen, Andy Hall, Chris Steele, Remy Bilodeau, Jason Hobbs, Mark Tasaka, Mirko Froelich, Pierre Mongrel, Brett Pazinski, Brandon Barnes, Eileen Barnes, Dan LaValle, C.W. Mellencamp, Victor Wyatt, Craig Huber, Roger Brasslett, Stefan Dragonspawn, Jared Rasher, Ray Otis, Todd Crapper, Jim Fitzpatrick, Old Scoozer Roleplaying, Curtis Takahashi, Larry Hout, Ron Bishop, Mark Richmond, Chad Gleyman, Sky, Craig, Howard Bishop, Josh Wallace, Corey Welch, Angus, Eric Salzweedle, George Sedgwick, Robert Nemeth, Brian Kurtz, Laramie Wall, Eric Avia, Andy Olson, Jeff Seifert, John Kayward, Corey Gonzalez, Maurice, Nile Diamond, Aaron Ralia, Jeff Goad, Aaron Coleman, Brian Rumble, Rich Wishon, David F. Baylog, Harrigan, Melissa Bashinsky, H.N., Cole Kago, Eric Tavola, Hus Carl, Ghost GM, Mike Kesh Jr., Rory Weston, Jim Ingram, Daniel Garrett, Eric Frankhouse Presents, Phil McClory, Adam Grote, John, Jay Plata, Ed Nice, The Duke in Purple, Isaiah Aries, Christian, Larry Hollis, Ewald Trooper, Craig Shipman, Todd Sharp, Orcus Dorcus, Chris Shorb, Michael O'Hallan, Wayne Peacock, Mike Coleman, Miniature Master, Kevin Keneally, Zagrave, Vornak, Farty McButterpants, Andrew Lear, Craig Chunglo, Eric Lunsford, Ty Prunty, Feeling Good Lewis, Ziga Praradzic, Nick Westbrook, John Mahoney, Crystal Eggstead, Zalea, and Todd. This, this has, has been, been a Litterbox, Litterbox Studio, Studio production. production.